What are some of the biggest misconceptions you hear about prison that you say not true? Well, the biggest one is the country club thing. People say, oh, he went to a country club. You know, they'll sit like a felon, a white collar felon. Ah, okay. You know, there's no such fucking thing. Okay. It is awful. That is Steve Madden. You may know him as the man who designed the shoes of a multi-billion dollar company, or perhaps from his character being portrayed in Martin Scorsese's The Wolf of Wall Street. Or maybe you know him from being sent away to federal prison for a pump and dump scheme. Regardless of where you know him from, Steve's intriguing story is truly one of a kind. So how does a world-renowned household name shoe designer wind up palling around with the most notorious Wall Street criminal of all time and land himself in federal prison? Well, it all started in the 70s. I worked in high school in a shoe store. Mm. And what was your experience in the shoe store that made you enjoy the process? Very creative time. You know, it was the 70s and mm -hmm. men and women were being creative. And I think the people that owned the businesses had been hippies and mm -hmm. gone to Woodstock. Mm -hmm. This is before my time. I, mean, I, I think that they were part of the counterculture. And then these people went into business, so they did things differently. And that's who sort of taught me. Despite his humble beginnings, Steve went on to become one of the most successful fashion designers in history, which naturally must have come from all the hard work he put into school, right? I wasn't studying. You weren't studying. No, what I was taking drugs okay. and, and going to discotheques. Okay, but no classes during that time? That. No, of course I did, but... Um, you know, it was very immature. And to me, it seems like such an interesting paradox that you're this phenomenal business leader, but then struggled so much as a student. Why do you think that is? You know, I just wasn't interested. Mm. Yeah, I, I wasn't interested. And also I have ADD and I couldn't focus and... You know, I was distracted with partying and stuff. I was young and immature. Steve was a hungry shoe designer with a dream to build a business. And where do big businesses go? Wall Street. But one does not simply walk down to Wall Street and start slinging deals. It's more complicated than that. Fortunately, Steve had a friend, this guy. Steve Madden. <laughs> Jonah Hill. No, wait, sorry, not Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill's character from The Wolf of Wall Street, who is loosely based off of Danny Porish, a childhood friend of Steve's. You see, Danny was working at a stock brokerage firm called Stratton Oakmont for this guy, Leonardo Dick, I mean Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. To put it in the simplest of terms, Jordan was a magical, electric, world-class criminal. Their exact scheme is a little bit complicated. You could read the fine print elsewhere, but all you really need to know is what they were doing was illegal, and Steve Madden found himself right in the middle of it. You see, Danny brought in Steve, and the Wolf of Wall Street made him a promise. If Steve agreed to let Stratton Oakmont take the Steve Madden company public, meaning listed on the New York Stock Exchange and run their little pump and dump scheme, Steve would become a multi-millionaire. I, I was guilty, I want to say. Uh, you know, I was involved with these guys and we were selling stocks back and forth and all of that. I regret the terrible stuff that took place. But Steve knew this was illegal from day one. So I asked him what advice would he have given himself if he could go back in time? I would say, you know, don't take shortcuts and don't be so fearful and you know, about money. And so it's like, oh my God, they're going to raise me this amount of money. I couldn't believe it. I never had a lot of money, but uh, fear, you know, fearfulness. Mm -hmm. I was always so fearful. What was the fear? I'm always of? fearful. You know, I was basically raised that way. Really? How yeah, so? Sort of like a psychiatrist you are there. <laughs> I'm a real medical doctor. So. You are a medical doctor. Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dr. Mike. Yes. So, yeah. So practice. I mean, I was raised by so. My family was uh, older than me. I was the baby of older brothers and all of that. And my parents were a lot older. So they were raised in the depression. Mm -hmm. You know, for you, you, you have to read about it in a book. But for me, I actually talked to the people that were actually in it. Mm -hmm. And everybody was poor and everybody was struggling. It was a crazy time in America. It will be like you trying to describe COVID one day, what mm -hmm. that was like. Um, and, uh, so my parents had all this fear, like you could go broke and you'll lose everything and you'll have to like have soup three times a day, sure. which was really real, man. And as quickly as Steve Madden's stock price may have launched during their initial public offering from $4.50 to over $18 on day one, Steve's entire life quickly came crashing down. He served a 41 month sentence in federal prison after being found guilty of stock manipulation, money laundering, and securities fraud. And while he admits the experience was awful and forced him to grow, it didn't come without a little hustle on the inside. You were a, a master mackerel dealer. Yes, I was. 
Tell us about your mackerel it's, dealings. I, I talked about a mackerel that used to have packages of it. And there was the currency. So like if you wanted to get your laundry done, you paid somebody two mackerels. Mm -hmm. You know, because you, there was no cash. You didn't need cash. Cash didn't mean anything in prison. It actually didn't. Wow. And uh, so macro was the currency because it was good. It tasted good. And you, people were always looking for food. And so if you took, and the mess hall was just vile. Mm. So if you took macro and you put it on, let's say, cup of soup, and you went to the hot water heater, right? And you mm -hmm. then you did the cup of soup and you drain the water out. Now you have like noodles, like pasta almost. <laughs> and you throw the mackerel over that and it's actually good. And you don't have to go to the chow hall and stand in line and go through all that bullshit. What are some of the biggest misconceptions you hear about prison that you say not true? Well, the biggest one is the country club thing. What's the country when, club When you hear thing? people say, oh, we went to a country club. You know, they'll like a felon, a white collar felon. Ah, okay. You know, there's no such fucking thing. Okay. It is awful. Because you've been in two different styles of prison. Well, I was in what they call a camp where there was no fences, but mm -hmm. you're not running away. I mean, and then there was one with fences. Okay. Um, one was a low and one was a camp, but they're t awful. And even without the fences, you know, there were still prison guards and you still had to be, you know, in your bunk and it was terrible. You're a big proponent of prison reform. What, what would you like to see changed? Well, they give out too much time, you know, generally speaking to people. Mm. You know, oh, you only got four years, like I'll hear. Like, do you know how long fucking four years is? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, you know, they, they're just too draconian with prison time, no matter what it is. I mean, I, I understand that violence is a different thing, but I'm sort of talking about nonviolent crimes, which mm -hmm. would be drugs mostly. You know, they just give out too much fucking time. Yeah. Yeah. What was your health experience like in prison? I know you got into some of the best physical shape. That yeah, I got in good shape. I worked out a lot. I learned how to lift weights. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was good, you know, because you got to kind of keep sharp. Of course. Yeah. Were you ever worried for your life in prison? Never. Never? Not for a minute. And you were friendly with all the Friends folks with there? every, you know, mind your own business, friendly mm -hmm. with people. What, what's a workout routine in prison like? What are you doing? Um, I actually, it's similar now, I, which hmm. is sort of, you sort of do the way guys in prison, they do one body part a okay. day, you know, sort of, okay. that's sort of what they do. That's sort of like the prison etiquette. So they're not doing like, like, like back and guy, by. No, if you see a guy doing chest three days a week, he's like, <laughs> he's fucking out. You know, like, you don't, he's, he's a punk. Okay, you don't want to yeah. talk to him. Okay. Um, you know, guys will walk by and make comments. Oh, you do chest, what do you do, chest every day? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, the idea is, you know, you will do really the the old timers, you know, not having to do with age, but, you know, sort of a mindset is like, you do one body part a week. Mm -hmm. So you do chest and then you let it rest for a week mm -hmm. and you hit it again. Legs, back, thighs, shoulders, tries. Are you doing so, any cardio? Not much. Okay. I just started to do Pilates. Oh. Lift weights and do Pilates. What made you uh, get inspired to do that? So I'm a little, you know, a little stiff. stiff. Not, I need to stretch as I get older. Yeah. And so I've been enjoying it. You know what bothers me about Pilates as kind of like a guy that likes to lift weights? They'll put on the smallest little weight on your leg and they'll make you do the smallest movement. And you feel so terrible that you can't do it. You're like, this is so oh, hard. Yeah. Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> I just did, I did it last night. But it was good. You know, I had the roller on my back mm -hmm. and I'm just doing some basic stuff, really stretching because I mm -hmm. never stretch. Really? Yeah. And I should. Is that catching up with you? Yes, for sure. What uh, What are you experiencing these no, days? No, I mean, you know, you're stiff and, you know, and I play a lot of golf and you need flexibility and I'm mm -hmm. not, so I'm really working on that. Man. I'm curious. I still love lifting weights. I love Really? It. Okay. I enjoy it. I love, I love going in the gym. I love listening to music. I love working out, you know, I do. I don't do a lot of multiple body parts. Yeah, you stick to one I group. do, man, you know, I might do, I might do back and buys, you know, mm -hmm. I, you know, I might do that, mm -hmm. you know. Sometimes I just do back and I just do buys. But when you say you do just back, you're doing compound lifts, right? You're not isolating. Well, so you're you doing try, rows or- Seated rows, you know. Uh, lat pull downs. The whole lat pull downs, yeah. bent over rows, you know, whatever, but- um, yeah, I guess it's come. I guess for it's, you, it I sounds guess. like it's almost therapy. No, 
I don't know if it's therapy, but I enjoy it. I love listening to the music. I love that moment. I love the way I feel when I leave the gym, you know, feel a little mm, pumped, pumped up and yeah. it's a nice feeling, you know? And, uh, cause we, you know, one, I am not the best eater. Mm. I want to be a good eater, but I'm not. It's just bullshit if I say. Is it a salt thing? It's salt and well, sugar. Well, I don't know, it Wow, and sugar. and sugar. I love sugar and I love salt. Mm. I do. Mm -hmm. It's hard. And I've tried to diet, you know. Mm -hmm. What When you try to diet, what is that? Uh, I try to you? give up sugar. All of it, entirely. Well, I try. That's aggressive. Well, I mean, you try I, to cold turkey it. It's not easy. Yeah, for sure. It's not easy. Yeah, yeah. What's but your uh, go-to cheat meal? Oh God. Well, so the big thing for me um, is sugar in my coffee. Mm. How much sugar are you throwing? I love it. It's and I swear I tried. I love coffee, and I, I sort of tried the synthetic sugars, you sure. know, stevia and. Mm -hmm. And it it just tastes so bad. What, what, really, what, what do you dislike about it? I'm just things? struggling with that. <laughs> because you know those sweeteners are actually sweeter than sugar. No, I know. And interestingly enough, this is really going to be the most boring podcast you've ever done. What do you mean? This but is absolutely amazing. Ice coffee, you can put a sweet and low, and it's fantastic. Huh. So it's ice coffee. Sugar. You can't put sugar in ice coffee. But if I put a sweet and low in a regular coffee, which is really what I love is regular coffee, mm -hmm. it tastes vile to me. I, huh. I I wince when I drink it. Well, you know, So that's a big thing. You know how your brain knows when you're having one of those artificial sweeteners versus the real sugar? Mm -mm, tell it, me. It's the time of which the sweetness lasts. When you have the artificial sweetener touch your tongue, it lasts longer. As opposed to real sugar, even though it's less sweet, it gives you the hit and then disappears right away. It dissolves on your tongue. I just don't like the taste. Yeah. That's yeah. why a lot of people say there's an aftertaste. Yeah. So what I'm struggling with now, just as long as I got you here, mm -hmm. is a, sort of a crash mm -hmm. in the, in the, and it's gotten more acute as I've gotten in my 60s, you know? When you say crash, what Like I'll get so drowsy mm -hmm. at around 12, one o'clock. I'll have the coffee in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I, it's almost to the point where I can't keep, like I have two people standing on my eyelids. Sure, sure. You know, it's really terrible. Are you sleeping well at night? No, no, I don't sleep well. Well, that's gonna be why. Um, any particular reason why? Is it because you have trouble falling asleep no, or I staying apnea. asleep? I think I have sleep apnea. Mm, okay. And you know why that impacts sleep? Yeah, sure. What's your understanding well, it's the of breathing it? breathing disrupts your sleep, right? Well, yeah. So basically when you have sleep apnea, your airway essentially closes. Yes. And it prevents you from going through the different stages of sleep. And as a result, you may not even realize you're waking up. But because your brain is not going through all the restful stages, you wake up feeling not refreshed. Yeah, I'm and at 12 o'clock, you get daytime sleepiness. And that's what's happening to me, Dr. <laughs> Mike. So I'm really struggling with that now. Mm -hmm. Are you anti-CPAP? No, I just haven't gotten it together oh. to do the CPAP thing. Okay. And I suppose so I need to do it. For sure. I got a lot of, it's an issue because it's it's really affecting me now. Steve isn't alone in his struggles with sleep. I know plenty of you out there struggle with it because even though I'm constantly talking about the benefits of sleep, even I have a hard time maintaining a consistent sleep schedule. I think this problem is getting really bad, not just on an individual level, but a societal level. Here's the bet I'm willing to place right now. The addiction we have to our phones, our never log off and hustle all day, everyday culture is destroying our sleep. And it's gonna have widespread negative effects on every aspect of society. 20, 30 years from now. Long-term health problems will start increasing from our lack of consistent sleep. And Steve says he's already feeling it. And I, I'm starting to forget things, mm. little basic sort of things. Mm -hmm. There's a girl that works for me, a designer, mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to send her a shoe. She's been with me 12 years or something. And I couldn't remember her name for like 35 seconds. I mean, that happens. No, I know it happens. <laughs> and no, I like this girl a lot. Sure. And she's important to me. And mm -hmm. I couldn't remember her name. And I struggled. And it took me 30 seconds. That's something new. Okay, so some new forgetfulness is yes, happening. Yes, new forgetfulness. Also, age Yes, playing of course, a role yes. And, and past lifestyle habits. I know you're pretty open about your drug use in the past. Oh, God, I took copious amounts of drugs. Yeah? What, I did. What were some of those of drugs. bad times? What, what were you doing? Well, I used to... I used to drink a lot mm -hmm. and then I got into a, there was a muscle relaxer that was very much sort of my age group. It was called Quaalude. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard people talk about it. It was well, very Wolf much- Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Those are all my guys. Those are all my contemporaries. Yeah. And we, it was just, it just, oh my God, it, this pill, you know, made you feel so great. You 
you know, and we got in trouble with it. And, uh, you know, it was like, it was an amazing pill. Just. Quaaludes are an amazing pill, amazingly bad. You see, the drug is technically called methoquaylone, and it's a hypnotic sedative. Among other effects, it lowers your blood pressure, slows your pulse, and breathing rate, dramatically relaxing you and making for a very effective medication to help you fall asleep. And because these drugs could quickly knock you out, it doesn't take a genius to see how it could be used for extremely nefarious purposes. It was actually discontinued in the US in the 1980s due to major side effects, including its extreme addictiveness, and the remaining pills became highly valuable on the black market. <laughs> you talk about it in such I, a I romanticized really, way. It's crazy. It really was. Well, it was, it's awful ultimately because, you know, I mean, you don't want to be addicted to anything, but it would made you feel so good. And it just did, you know, and then I got sober and then I got, and then I went out again and it was on uh, opiates. Mm -hmm. pill, Vicodin, right? Yes, Vicodin painkillers. The thing about that drug is, is that you, you know, you need more and more. Yeah. You build, build up a tolerance. Yeah. And right. if you don't, and then if you don't take it, you get sick. Really sick. Yes. So you got a double pronged fucking, mm -hmm. it's awful. It's like you're kidnapped. Yeah. It's like being fucking kidnapped. Yeah. I'm sober now a while. Congratulations. Clean and awesome. sober, which is great. I'm quite proud of it. And so, but it was, it was terrible. What was your strategy for becoming sober this time around? Well, there was only one way for me to really get sober, and that was to go to a 12-step program. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, certain things- I don't even know if, you know, it's sort of a principle. We don't, the 12-step program, you're not allowed to sort of mention it, you know. Uh, and, uh, um, but I, I have to tell people- Of course. What, I don't see any other way. And I don't know why it works either. Well- but I could tell you it works. Well, the problem is with quitting certain substances, some you can go cold turkey. Yeah. And biologically, medically, it makes sense. But those like benzodiazepines, the yes. Xanaxes of the world, the opiates of the world. Sure. Quitting those cold turkey is brutal on your body. Yes. Alcohol, brutal yeah. on yeah. your body. Yeah. You could develop seizures if yes, you've been drinking course, very yeah. heavily yes. and stop abruptly. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the negative effects of these illicit substances. Do you think at any point those things gave you an edge business-wise earlier? No, there's nothing. Never. Nothing, no, zero. Because you see all these Wall Street people do no, cocaine and all this. No, absolutely not. There is an, you know, there was always this thing, you know, there's always these great writers who were, you know, Joyce and Hemingway and and Truman Capote, whatever, drunken writers or Fitzgerald, whatever, sure. you know, and like, oh, it's like they got sober and they couldn't write anymore. That's fucking bullshit. Okay. That is total crap. Most, first of all, a lot of those guys are very prolific when they're young. It's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. It's just a whole other podcast. Yeah. But it's not my experience, but because I've been successful after that. But um, but they're romanticizing it in the same way that no, you I look know, back but, at it fondly. But the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is getting sober will enhance your career, whether it's shoes, mm. medicine, or, uh, you know, you're a musician. And I could sure. point to someone like Eric Clapton, who's mm -hmm. almost in his seventies and he's he's still great. Yeah, He got sober, he was a falling down junkie and he got sober and James Taylor. And well, they say some of the best so art many, comes from pain. So many great musicians got sober. And then you, I always wanted to know what happened to the ones that flamed out. Sure. Like what, what happened to this group? They were so amazing. If you look and dig down, you'll find it's, it's substance abuse. I was glad to see Steve take such a strong stance against these drugs, but there is one he thinks does come with a significant advantage, Adderall, an ADHD medication designed to help with focus. It's a powerful and legal medication, but one you could only get with a prescription from a doctor if you really need it. Well, Adderall, that's a different drug. Oh, well, why is that well, different? Well, because why Adderall, Adderall uh, slows the front of your brain down mm -hmm. and it allows you to focus, sort of focus. And it does works on kids, all the kids in the schools. I've never taken it, but uh, all the kids in the colleges are taking, are, are taking Adderall. Yeah. Like every kid, I think. <laughs> Not every kid. I've never touched Adderall in my life. No, but I'll, you know what I'm saying. No, a lot of I mean, people do your, take it. Your, your in med school, it was Your rampant. generation. Yeah, yeah. They, were, they were abusing it. Every, every I, I know a lot of friends have daughters who that do? go to, you know, Wisconsin and Indiana and mm -hmm. Michigan and Tulane and everyone is on Adderall. 
And are they on it by a doctor who's diagnosed yes. them or just a, yeah, buying no, it? From no, no, they, they get it and they, and they do well in school. So do you think that's a problem? Do you view that as a problem? I don't think it's great. Why? I don't, I, I don't know. I think it's a problem. I think they're getting through school, but I don't know that they're really learning and getting any wisdom. I think that's a valid point. And uh, I, I know, I know a few kids, uh, friends' daughters, you know, and they're doing well in school. The grades are fantastic, 3.0, 4.0, whatever, point oh. But if you talk to them about what's going on in the world, they have no fucking idea. But that's pretty typical for kids, wouldn't you say? No, they really don't have any real knowledge. <laughs> they really don't. <laughs> but I mean, rewind to when you were 18. Did they you really know what don't. was going on? No, I was, I was very, I was both <laughs> fucked up and smart. <laughs> And was into, I knew stuff. Okay. But that's because I came from a family that was- Aware. You know, and talked about current events at dinner and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know. Yeah, I feel like it, it prevents them from building habits that lifelong are gonna allow them to continue learning. I think learning, you know, you, you can't be high. Yeah. You know, I just don't see it. Yeah. The quest for knowledge. Now, the other argument is, how is Google for learning as opposed to, you know, cracking open a book or, you know, you can- we can Google anything now. Well, forget Google. We could chat GPT now. Have you seen this stuff? Yeah, yeah. Does that scare I, the living? No, it doesn't scare me. No, it, it scares me. Progress doesn't scare me. But that's not progress. Well, I mean, whatever it is. I mean, it is. Technology. Uh, innovation. Doesn't, it doesn't scare me. I accept it. But like, but you, Adderall, you watch like iRobot or something where the robots take over. You're, you don't fear that a little bit? No, I don't. I don't really. I don't. I actually don't. You know, let's just say that. So the smartphone. Yeah. You know, the kids are on their smartphones, so they're it's blocking them from reading and doing other stuff. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, the smartphone is great. I mean, let's be honest, it's amazing. Sure. There's I worry so many... about an artificial intelligence. I don't worry about technology. Well, you because you're way ahead of me. I'm still, <laughs> you're I'm still, still on, on the smartphone. smartphone. <laughs> but think about like so there's good and bad. I mean, yeah. you know, and the radio you know, TV took over for the radio. People no, would say, oh my God, you're not using your imagination. Sure, sure. And you used to hear these great things on the radio and this wonderful world of, uh, in your brain came on. And But that wasn't the case at all. Yeah. They and, used to say the same about newspapers when newspapers came out. Yes. So the truth of the matter is there is a, there is a price to pay for the smartphone, but I love it. Mm -hmm. I do... I do mean, you let your kid use it? They do. Mm. It is a battle that I cannot win, <laughs> sadly. Do you put limitations on screen time? or I don't, really? and I should, and I know I'm trying, but yeah. it's a losing battle. My wife does, my ex-wife okay. does. She's much better than me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, you when, know what I'm trying to say. Of course, of course. I, I understand that we shouldn't stifle innovation. What I will tell you, Dr. Mike, yeah. I am a reader. Okay. I've been a reader my whole mm -hmm. life and I don't read as much now. And I know. Is that because, that's because you choose not to? Or? No. I know it's because of the smartphone mm. because my brain is just Distracted. wired different now. Well, it's I a can drug. Do, I'm doing 10 things. I'm on the phone yeah. and I'm literally doing checking stocks, reading Twitter, you know, You're looking at the weather. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, reading this, reading the newspaper, uh, looking at pictures. I do mean, you think it's distracting it, us from our I'm anxieties? Doing, like, No, but I'm doing like 10 things at once. I'm there. I'm like, whoa, blah, 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 blah. you know, but I can't read like I used to. Yeah. Because my brain gets like, after a while, it's something, something is not firing the right way. It's almost yeah. like dyslexia. Sure. Well, I mean, it's, it's fueling the ADD diagnosis that you totally. mentioned. Totally. If you weren't ADD, you are ADD. <laughs> and if you were ADD, like me, you're on another level of fucking... Deficit disorder. Steve is proudly sober, but he still has one vice, nose spray, which he actually pulled out of his pocket in the middle of our interview. Oh, this is cool. I get to talk about your uh, nasal spray thing in jail also, right? You were- yeah, smuggled it you in. You were smuggling it yeah. in. How did you get on that? So just, it's a, you know, my nose gets super stuffed. Mm -hmm. And so I use it and it clears it up. That's it. Simple as that. Yeah. And then the rebound is quite- It's big. terrible. Yeah. That's like what I always warn my patients that no more than two, three days- because the second you stop, it comes back raging. Don't give raging. it to them. Don't what? Don't let them get on it. Yeah, it, it's a big problem. Because the, the way that it works is it actually shrinks the blood vessels in your nose. 
so that your nose produces less mucus. But then the second you discontinue it, the blood vessels rapidly expand, create more mucus and you feel terrible. Yeah. Do you feel like it gives you any other edge? Because I know some tennis players use it for like uh, a focus thing as well. No. Because they changed the, the ingredients in it over the last 10, 20 years. Yeah. Before it used to use like a type of adrenaline almost. Yeah, no. No, no not giving you that. No. And why was it popular in jail? Or was it just popular? No, for I mean you? I smuggled it in because for I couldn't yourself. breathe. My nose was oh, stuffed. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and they they sell only saline in prison. Ah, okay. But you put it in a saline bottle. And you're I like, did. Very good. You remembered. Did I say that in the book? Yeah, in the yeah, book. That's great. Obviously, Steve Madden has lived quite the colorful life, which is why I wanted to ask him how he felt when he was first told he would be portrayed in The Wolf of Wall Street. Was he involved in any decision making or was he subject to whatever Scorsese wanted to do with his story? Oh, God, I was yeah. so upset, freaked out. Upset? Oh, yeah, The Wolf of Wall Street. I but think, isn't oh. this like a great way to No, it turned out to be very good for me. And okay. It was good for our brand and it, it, it was... It treated me well. The film treated me okay. You know, it didn't sort of treated me as a victim in the film, which I was not actually. You know, I wasn't a victim, but I was treated. So that was good. It was sort of a nerdy character in the film. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dustin Hoffman's son, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Did you like who they chose? Well, he's much better looking than me. So that was, <laughs> so that was good. You know, it's always good to have that. Um, so we, I never got together with him. I was supposed to. Really? We were supposed to meet a few times because he dated he he dated a girl that was a model for me. Wow. And uh, she was supposed to get us together. And what came back to me was that uh, Martin Scorsese wouldn't let him meet me. Interesting. And they, yet they had Jordan Belfort in the film at the end. Yes. Yeah. But you, they excluded. Why is that? You know, I don't know, but he didn't want him to meet me and it's fine. I mean, I don't really... Not, not that big a deal, but but he was great. I mean, he was good. I would like to meet him one day and sure. you know shake his hand. I mean, come on. He Did you develop me. any relationships with the other cast, Leo or Martin Scorsese or anybody? No, I'm such Jonah a big fan of uh, of Martin Scorsese, and I did meet DiCaprio. I did meet him at my favorite Italian restaurant, which is what it was. Scalina, it was a place called Scalinatella on Sixty First Street. Okay, and. Uh, and I wasn't to Scorsese, obviously. His films are, you know, fantastic. And uh, and I looked at his townhouse to buy it one day. <laughs> but uh, we never got to meet. He filmed in my store, by the way. They did a, sh they did a scene, I think it was edited out of the film, mm -hmm. in the store, which was a you know, surreal experience. Because, you know, when I started the business in 1993, now here we are you know, in 2014 and they're, you know, it's kind of like, you know, like a the Al Jolson story or something. You're too young to remember. I don't know who but, that is. <laughs> um, you know, it was an interesting thing to watch part of your life be recreated for Hollywood. And the fact that they're not consulting you on this is well, wild on the, to yeah, me. Yeah, well, on the store they did. I, oh, was at the, the I was at the shoot, you know, a little bit. Then, I mean, he does it remote, some of the scenes. Scorsese, really? Yes. Wow. He's remote. Even though Steve served his time and has moved on from prison, he's still been very critical of the US prison system and is doing his part to help his fellow inmates follow in his footsteps by regularly hiring former felons to work in his company. You made that one of the missions, right? When you came out to yeah, hire? Yeah, I tried to do what I could do. How do you feel doing that now? Do you feel like that's a successful route or do you feel like it gets you into trouble? We don't have enough, you know, but guys are, it's a tough one. Yeah. Guys, people in prison, you know, mostly they're drug dealers. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you just move the mic? Because I'm yeah, losing sure. you a little bit. Yeah. They're mostly drug dealers. So, mm -hmm. you know, they used to have the quick buck. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for them, some of them. But I, yeah. I have two guys that are executives in my company that I did time with. Wow. Yeah. One of the biggest health problems I see from my patients is a wide variety of different pains stemming from poorly designed footwear. So with the cobbler himself seated right in front of me, I had to ask the big question. When designing shoes, are you thinking about looks, fashion, style, or is there a functionality health component, because I see so zero. many people. Zero. Zero. Can I motivate you to start thinking yes, about the poor foot? Yes, of course foot? I want to do that, but what we mostly think about is how they look. Okay. Do you know how many patients come to me with problems with heel spurs? No, that's good stuff. I don't mean to make light of it, but I'm just saying we're, <laughs> I'm focused on how it looks. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Because I, I can't begin to say how many people develop foot problems from yeah. tiny footwear. Sure. 
I have a neuroma. You do. I do. From tight fitting footwear. I like I your guess, shoes. Yeah. Well, Steve, maybe we can talk to someone who designed shoes about making some footwear that fit a little better and cut down on your foot injuries. Speaking of foot pain, click here to see a video about one of my wildest patient encounters of all time that started with foot pain. And as always, stay happy and healthy.